welcome everybody. My name is Sharon Rundle-Teeley. I work at Griffith University and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome those who are here in the room. And just for those in the room, we've also got people here and I welcome you online. Um, so it's my pleasure to be here to host Logan City Council's very first Koala Forum. And Wildlife Watcher is all about um, trying to get people who might not normally think about koalas to understand more about the actions they can take and to also help raise awareness for the wonderful actions that many of the people like our speakers tonight and yet others are taking. And I myself have enjoyed a couple of conversations tonight with a couple of people who are here, just understanding how much locals actually do from planting trees themselves, rescuing animals, getting boxes installed on their properties. There are so many ways that we can all come together to actually see if we can actually help take the koala away from its endangered status. Because the listing of endangered is a pretty important one. It actually says they've got a less than 20% chance of surviving in the wild. So the more we can all come together and actually do, and I don't need to talk to you, but the more we start doing it and showing others how to do it, the better it gets. And over the years of the work I've been doing, which I've been working on this issue since 2016, I've had the joy of watching my own local community talk about koalas that have come into their local area, and I've watched them learn and know more and more and more about what they can actually do to actually help. So I'm glad to have you here. Keep your questions for me. Um, tonight there will actually be a Slido-like counter that we can actually use, so you can actually write your questions in as they come. So what we will be doing tonight is actually asking speakers to come up. They will speak in turn, and then we'll be posting questions and answers and giving you all a chance to actually input. So for those at home, your way of doing it is to actually talk to us online and through the Slido as well. But before we start, I would like to actually pay my respects to the people who were here before us, before the concrete and before the glass. They have a lot to teach us. They did look after their environment. They lived in a different world. And we have got a very fast-paced world that's all about us buying things and growing and doing things. And, and maybe we need to be rethinking that a little bit more. So I do pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, and I'm so glad that they've got so much to teach us. So this is the Slido technology. If you haven't met it before, if you scan that QR code, you now have the rights to proper question in at any point that it actually comes up. It now sits there for me and the team, and we will go and address as many of those questions tonight with you all as we actually can. So you can also voice a bit later as well and talk, but this is our way of helping to actually manage it, um, to share some questions with our speakers as they go through tonight. So for now, I have no more than um, a bit of a job to do, and that is to actually talk through for the speakers and actually introduce them to you. And also just to talk about the many wonderful organisations who are out there tonight. So if you haven't spoken to them, information's available here and things that we have to share for you. But do get involved and do actually talk to them as they go forward. So Sam Colbrand, she works with Logan City Council and tonight she's going to be talking to you about the excellent initiatives that they've been undertaking for some years now. So over to you, Sam. Good evening, everyone. It's fantastic to see so many people here in the room and also hello to those joining us online. And I'd just like to extend a thanks to Griffith University for inviting Logan City Council along to talk at the event. Um, as Sharon noted, I'm Sam and I'm from Logan City Council's Natural Environment and Sustainability Program. Our program is responsible for a range of different initiatives, including engaging with our community to deliver our Land for Wildlife program, delivering actions on council-owned land such as revegetation projects, and also providing planning advice internally for projects. And we work together to um, work towards our shared goal, which is to shape a green future together. So tonight I'll be outlining some of the koala conservation um, measures that Logan City Council is taking. Um, and before I get underway, I'd also like to just acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we meet today and thank them for the thousands of years of respect and care that they have had for our natural environment and also acknowledge and um, extend respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders that are joining us online. 
So we all know that koalas are really an iconic Australian animal. And we are fortunate to call them, um, that they call Logan home. But before I move into more some of those actions, I guess I just wanted to address one of the common questions we get asked, that is, where can I find koalas in Logan? Now, koalas are notoriously hard to find because they're so good at camouflaging within the tree canopy. But we've been very thankful to our community who have been actively reporting koala sightings. And this map here just shows the koala reported sightings that we've received um, over the calendar, 2023 calendar year. And then this one is the koala sightings um, that's been over the last decade, showing the community sightings in blue and also um, expert sightings such as those collected from government organisations and researchers. Um, and so we can really see that there is a distribution of koala sightings across the city. Um, and so I guess that just leads me to one question, hoping get to get the um, engagement of the audience here in the room, but if you could put your hand up if you've seen a koala recently. Wow, that's fantastic to see so many people put their hands up. And to keep that hand up if you've actually reported that sighting. Oh, fantastic to see people have actually following that initiative. And I guess I just really wanted to reiterate the importance of reporting those koala sightings and encouraging others that you know who do see koalas to report those sightings because it's really important information that a range of different organisations and researchers use to help inform their management actions and activities. Um, yeah, so that was supposed to go with that. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to break down some of the initiatives that Logan City Council is doing, and these kind of fall, in, fall, like, fall into four main pillars, which are protecting koala habitat, enhancing koala habitat, improving the health and safety for koalas, and also increasing community education and awareness. So, in terms of protecting koala habitat, through Council's environmental levy um, program, we um, have acquired bushland for conservation purposes. So council recognises that acquisition for conservation is very important and a, a component to protecting um, core koala habitat, enhancing key corridors for connectivity. So in the last several years, we've um, purchased several key properties with koala habitat and that's acquired to about 280 hectares or about 523 football fields. Um, in addition to this, we also, through our Logan planning scheme, map um, habitat networks across the city. This includes our biodiversity corridor network, our environmental management and conservation areas, our waterway corridors, and so forth. And this mapping is reviewed and maintained as part of that planning scheme process. And also, we work with our private landholders to, um, for a range of voluntary um, environmental conservation partnerships and agreements. And Logan City Council's Land for Wildlife program has been one of the fastest growing in most recent years in southeast Queensland. And we now have over 487 properties involved. In addition to the Land for Wildlife component, we also have a broader environmental conservation partnerships program. And there's over 1,000 members in that, which helps to um, engage with those property owners that have smaller um, property sizes. When it comes to enhancing koala habitat, um, we have been working with Skilling Queenslanders for Works, which um, are commu like community-based organisations who engage um, long-term unemployed or disengaged youth to complete um, restoration activities on council-owned land. And a lot of these actions have been focused around um, key wildlife corridors and key movement corridors. And particularly, they've been targeting um, lantana and planting some native trees to help establish and enhance those corridor connections. We also have been undertaking a range of restoration works along some of our key waterways, so our Logan and Albert Rivers, and also some of our smaller waterways, such as Beliver Creek in, in the Windaroo um, area, and also our really urbanised, more urbanised areas of Slacks and Scrubby Creek. We also have our environmental offsets program. So 
This program has been running for several years and the funds are collected via Council's development assessment process. So at the moment we have 24 established offset sites across the city and the majority of these fall on our Logan and Albert River corridors and on those 24 sites we've used and all planted over 110,000 native plants and covered over 100,000, oh, 100 hectares. <laughs> um, and in a, one of our largest, our largest site is the Cedar Grove Environmental Centre, which was established in 2019. And there's over 36,000 plants that have um, established there, over 33 hectares. And more recently, Council um, has purchased a new property for environmental offsets, and that's a gonna be a 40 hectare property and excitingly, before we got underway with um, putting plants in the ground, we did some fauna surveys of the existing vegetation um, that was within the connecting uh, waterway there. And we were actually had a mum and Joey captured on camera. So it's great to know that we're planting in the right area for koalas. So koalas face a range of threats. Um, including habitat loss, uh, cars, dogs, bushfires, and climate change. And so through the collection of those, that information that you're sharing about your wildlife sighting, your koala sightings, they're really important because it helps us to understand if there, what threats are out there and also where and when to and what times to implement um, mitigation actions. So council... Um, I'm just going to talk to some of the key actions that we're doing. So into, we have been rolling out some wildlife movement solutions. So these are measures that we um, do to help raise driver awareness and education when they're moving along roads, particularly during key koala breeding season. We've, um, we roll out our koala breeding banners and we'll put them and move them across the city. There is also, we've been rolling out in key um, hotspot locations, our um, wildlife electronic signs, such as the one pictured on the slide, which will flash up and, um, I guess, relay information to the driver based on their speed um, and hopefully give them that warning to slow down if they are going too fast. Another big area that we've been focusing on is our domestic dog awareness and education. And um, we've been installing some educational signage about the importance of training your dog to be wildlife aware. Um, in some of our um, dog off-leash areas, but also in some key parks across the city where people um, love to go and walk their dog. Um, we've also worked with Griffith University to um, deliver a um, dog fest event in Logan. And we've been working with our animal um, and management team to achieve initiatives around um, community education through the animal management plan. In addition to these actions, we also, Council also undertakes weed management um, across the over 900 parks that Council um, owns and manages. We also um, have our wild dog um, management actions, which includes baiting in key areas. And also we have our bushfire hazard reduction um, plan, which um, to help, in, and that includes our regular prescribed burns as part of our disaster management response plan. Um, and then in this space as well, Council provides support to our fabulous wildlife carers and organisations through some financial support to, um, through our environmental program, environmental grants program. And the last little pillar I was going to talk about is engaging with the community. So um, we co are constantly aware that good land management practices benefit the environment as a whole, but also koala populations co and koala habitat. So we actively seek to educate and engage and support the community to, take, to make informed decisions. So we have um, for three consecutive years been rolling out our community education campaign for koala breeding season. This has been having a strong social media campaign in front and um, again through working with Griffith we've been able to um, 
uh, understand how the community um, is recalling those key campaign messages and adapt and improve that messaging each year to hopefully reach a new, um, new targeted audience. And we've also had some great outcomes in terms of behaviour change, seeing a, a great intake, uh, uptake in people reporting koala sightings. In addition to that, we have our Enviro Grants funding, which is for a range of on-ground action. It could be for on-ground actions, community education and awareness, researchers, and also supporting our wildlife carers. So those grants are open now, actually. If um, anyone's interested, happy to talk to you further outside. Um, and we also host a range of different events throughout the years, and these are for um, exciting with like more kids focused events to more informative educational events for adults and also even doing some landholder specific workshops that for like bushfire hazard reduction which has a benefit to koalas. Um, and then of course we have a range of different community programs such as our bush care program and also our land for wildlife program. And I guess I just wanted to finish on um, the fact that Koala, koala conservation is a shared um, opportunity for everyone to be involved, from local governments to the community to business owners to developers. So I just wanted to end it with some tips that you can take home to help us, to help you, to help koalas. So number one being that importance of reporting your sightings, learning the signs of a sick or injured koala, knowing who to call um, when you, if you, or if you unfortunately come across a sick or injured or orphaned koala learning and looking up um, how your local wildlife care is, spreading that awareness to your community. Like, hey, you know, that resident koala on our street, he's on the move today, so those sorts of things. Um, training your dog for wildlife awareness and um, attending community events. So, um, yeah, happy to talk to anyone else after about any of those initiatives as well. Thank you. was very, very excellent, Sam. Thank you so much. I know public speaking is not everyone's favourite thing to do, so putting Sam up on stage is a, a very big ask. It's possibly not her favourite thing. Now, I'm just going to remind you, you can put questions for Sam into the chat, so if there's anything else that's come to mind, as she said, she's happy to talk outside, she's happy to talk in here, but I do know they've been working so, so hard um, to actually do a lot for what they can do. Now, Kim reminded me that what this actually is, if you scan it, is the ability to actually have it on your phone always. So if your memory is a little bit like mine, which I forgot to talk about this, you can actually just have this on your phone and it's always there. So rather than having to try and remember, if you actually then later on do see a koala and you're not sure what to do, sometimes just going to the people who know best is the best way to go. Because sometimes I've had people ring me saying, is it too small? You know, should it be out there on its own? You know, if you don't know, it possibly is best just to get the assurance so that you feel like you've actually been able to actually help them too. Because if we can see a sick koala and we can call it in, we actually have a better chance of saving it if we report it sooner. So if in doubt, just ask. There are so many people with great hearts who are happy to help. So if I may now, Marie is my next speaker for tonight. And if I could ask Marie to come forward and talk about the fabulous work that you do. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Marie and I am one of the um, project officers from Queensland Trust for Nature um, who is coordinating the Koala Habitat Restoration Partnerships Program. Um, it's a bit wordy, so I'll just be referring to it as the KHRPP or the program from here on in. Okay. Oh, sorry. So to begin with this evening, I'll be providing some background to the program and an overview of the projects that we are currently working um, uh, on across South East Queensland. I'll then be focusing in to give you a better understanding of what an individual restoration project look, looks like um, with a case study from the Woodstock Farm, uh, which is located right here in Logan City. I'll then conclude by outlining upcoming actions at the Woodstock Farm, as well as more broadly in South East Queensland. 
Uh, so just broadly, uh, the KHRPP is a five-year, $4.6 million project funded by the Queensland Government uh, to restore ko koala habitat in mapped koala priority areas, um, as well as koala habitat restoration areas, um, as well as other high-value koala areas across SEQ. The program was implemented in 2019 to address the urgent need for strategic habitat restoration across SEQ under the state's um, koala conservation strategy. So the immediate goal was to kickstart restoration projects um, that will contribute to the ultimate target of 10,000 hectares. The program is being implemented by us at QTFN um, in partnerships with the Department of Environment, Science and Innovation. So to date, um, we've had two project rounds uh, resulting in 16 individual project sites, um, all of which uh, will receive approximately four years of um, uh, support for primary works and maintenance. Uh, there has been uh, over 230,000 koala trees planted in revegetation areas, um, which includes infill planting, um, as well as supplementary plantings in uh, assisted region areas. Uh, in total, approximately 150 hectares of new koala habitat um, is being established and 247 hectares of existing koala habitat uh, is being regenerated. And this is predominantly through weed management. We've installed uh, about 6,500 metres of fauna-friendly uh, cattle, exclu uh, cattle exclusion fencing around certain restoration areas. And we've also currently got three ecological burns scheduled for uh, before June this year. Yep. Uh, so paramount to this program uh, are the 25 formal partnerships um, that have been established. Uh, and um, big uh, sort of shout out to the landholders uh, who generously pr uh, provide their land for restoration and who also contribute in-kind labour as well as funding. We also have partnerships with local governments, uh, other non-for-profit organisations and even some contractors who, who go be above and beyond um, to help us achieve our, our outcomes. We've so far supported three community and corporate planting uh, events on uh, KHRPP properties um, with up to 60 uh, attendees in one event. Um, and we've also supported two QTFN run education and citizen science, ca uh, science camps at a different KHRPP property. Um, uh, and that was uh, really valuable in collecting flora and fauna uh, records, uh, including koala as well as 13 other threatened species. Um, so I'm hoping that you'll be able to see on this map um, the uh, project sites, which you'll see uh, are the stars, um, and probably not so clear are their proximity to um, the state's mapped koala priority areas. Um, so we do try and get uh, our, our project sites sort of within or near to those koala priority areas, or within um, the other mapped, uh, state mapped habitat areas. Uh, so in our initial desktop assessment, um, properties located in those, in those areas um, are given higher scores. Um, however, it's important to note that we do um, consider a range of other criteria when we're um, sort of going through our final project site selection um, pr process. Uh, this includes healthy land and waters, koala priority hotspots, which you'll see there in the red polygons. Um, we also have local government priority areas which in some circumstances uh, can provide um, sort of finer scale koala mapping. Um, what else are we doing? Uh, sort of direct observations on sites is a big, a big part of it as well. Uh, we also consider operational factors, um, such as things like access, um, which uh, can have major implications to us being able to achieve on ground works. Uh, probably another major one is um, landholder willingness to agree to a legally binding uh, protective mechanism, um, which is a major factor for some people. Uh, it is a requirement of the Department of uh, the Department of Environment and Science, um, and this is to safeguard restoration areas into the future. Uh, so, just for one example here. Uh, Probably uh, to the sort of northwest, you'll see one property there within uh, the south, south no, northwest, 
Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm looking at it upside down. Um, and so this property wasn't located within, uh, within or near any of the state's mapping layers. Um, however, when we got onto the property, uh, we noticed uh, that it had a strong evidence of koalas, um, just from speaking to the landholder and from them sending us photos quite regularly, um, we realised that there was uh, likely a permanent koala, po uh, koala cluster on that property, um, so that was a major draw card for us. Uh, they also had a, a large area that they were willing to revegetate and were willing to put that under a protective mechanism, so that's why we decided to run with that property. All right, so now I'm just going to hone in a little bit into one of our round one project sites, which is the Woodstock Farm. The landholder of this property is the Youth Enterprise Trust, um, which is a wonderful organisation that is working hard towards creating a social enterprise model uh, on the property, which is to benefit uh, the public, community and environment. And this closely aligned with our values at the KHRPP. The property is mapped within a koala habitat restoration area, which is the sort of orange, um, and is bordered by bushland or good connectivity of bushland uh, on three sides. Um, and again, the landholder regularly sees koalas. <coughs> So since 2020, the program has funded weed management over 35 hectares of existing bushland um, and is also creating an additional 11 hectares of habitat corridors through revegetation. So many of the restoration areas uh, are exhibiting uh, sort of high levels of plant survival now um, and uh, are showing uh, signs of good resilience. However, even after nearly four years, there is still a way to go um, in terms of achieving site capture. So uh, there are multiple factors that have contributed to this. Uh, one of the major ones being the extent of smothering vines along the Albert River, as you can see up here. Um, <clears throat> now, anyone who has had the pleasure of uh, treating cat's claw um, or balloon vine or something similar um, will know the level of investment that's required to both uh, get those weeds to a manageable level and then to keep them like that, um, especially in riparian zones. Now, the property also endured uh, three extreme weather events in the project period, uh, beginning with the flood event in 2022, which caused major damage to plantings on the floodplain. Uh, it also restricted access for us to get in there for uh, months to follow. <coughs> Following on from these wet conditions, we then went through a long period of dry weather in 2023. Um, and this all also impacted on uh, the growth and survival of plants. So by the end of 2023, we started seeing some rain again, um, which was fantastic, a huge relief. Um, however, uh, the property in December was impacted by that devastating cyclone uh, that hit the region. And while the impacts of the uh, cyclone were relatively minor in those restoration areas, uh, contractors again had to be redire redirected away from site capture and towards damage control. So, in spite of all the setbacks that we've had, uh, we were fortunate to have an incredible support network to assist us with um, uh, post-disaster cleanups and also value-add restoration projects. <coughs> uh, for instance, um, the post-flood cleanup drew volunteer crews from Queensland Parks and Wildlife um, and Communify trainees. Um, who worked alongside QTFN and e-collaboration uh, to fix damage, uh, the damaged plantings. Um, we were also fortunate to have received two consecutive Enviro grants through Logan City Council, um, which helped us to finance uh, those infill plantings. More recently, the property was host to a corporate planting uh, event that was funded by the corporation um, and with uh, the KHRPP funding sort of supportive maintenance um, to ensure those plants survived. Uh, so we had crews from Ecolaboration, Youth Enterprise Trust and QTFN there to support the initial event um, with the remaining trees installed by trainees from Communify um, as well as skilling Queenslanders for work. So 
So uh, since the KHRPP contract is finished up in June 2000, and, uh, so June this year, um, and the site is not fully captured, uh, Queen, uh, QTFN is applying for alternative grant funding um, to continue restoration works at the property. Uh, the application will include funding to widen the floodplain habitat corridor, uh, which is the sort of green, green hatch, hatch down there, um, widen that corridor and to also take, uh, undertake some uh, bank stabilisation works. Um, we'll be looking to maintain existing plantings to establishment, um, continuing to maintain those smothering uh, vine weeds in the riparian zone. Um, and we're also wanting to undertake some ecological burning uh, in the uh, more mature bushland areas. Um, and that's to improve forest health and also reduce fuel loads. Um, sorry. I sort of got ahead of myself. <laughs> um, but yeah, so together we're hoping that with continued support through Logan City Council, um, uh, through their Land for Wildlife program and Enviro grants, um, as well as the ongoing presence of uh, the uh, CAME, so the Conservation and Ecosystem Management trainees, we're hoping to achieve those desired koala habitat um, outcomes within uh, a few years. So, uh, across South East Queensland, uh, we, will be, we will be closing out on our round one projects, in, uh, ensuring that all restoration um, areas are well established and resilient, or that measures are in place um, for ongoing maintenance to see them through to site capture. Where works were unable to be completed, uh, such as ecological burns, um, we will then extend those contracts. Uh, we'll also have a new suite of projects underway in June 2024 including two projects that are, have already commenced, um, having received al alternative federal and stra uh, state grant funding, um, and the KHRPP will then support those primary works um, for an uh, extended few years. Um, we also have three exciting kind of side projects happening um, that we're planning to kick off this year, uh, and we urge anyone who's interested to please make contact with us. Uh, these include a scattered paddock tree and shelter belt trials, um, which we're uh, pretty excited about. Um, uh, so this is intended to connect uh, koala habitat areas um, across cleared grazing land, um, such as sort of corridors like this picture. Um, and so that is uh, to provide safe passage for koalas and other wildlife um, and also has benefits for uh, livestock welfare um, as well as productivity. The Free Trees Program will provide free koala trees as well as planting aids uh, to landholders through existing free tree programs uh, such as Land for Wildlife. Um, and we also want to support community groups to um, also undertake uh, their own uh, koala habitat plantings. Um, so we have one community planting, uh, an edu education event coming up in April, um, and we're also uh, pretty excited to sort of, um, yeah, work with other organisations who are wanting to do a similar kind of model. So thank you very much. Thanks, Marie. It was really great to hear about the work that QTFN's doing and just to see it in picture form. So for everyone in the room and online, if you can put your questions for Marie, please, into the Slido. Um, it gives our team an ability to just pull it all together. All questions with the speakers will be at the end. Um, but what we will do in the meantime is actually give you all an opportunity and a chance to have a bit of a refreshment break. So for those in the room, if you want to actually jump up um, and head on outside, You've only got 10 minutes and we're going to be kicking off again. And same for you online. If you just want to go and grab yourself a, a cup of tea, uh, have a bit of a stretch, uh, we'll be back with our next two speakers. Thank you. So if anyone has noticed this, um, we were originally going to have five speakers, but we've had a bit of... Just life gets in the way sometimes. And one of our speakers is in bad health due to a spider bite. 
um, and couldn't be present tonight. So we wish Kate a very speedy recovery because it doesn't sound like it's a whole lot of fun. On top of that, Sophie was advertised to be speaking tonight, but uh, Maggie has kindly taken her place because COVID has got in the way. So do forgive us for just the slight departures and changes that have actually kicked in, but I would really like to thank Maggie for stepping in with almost no notice um, and would like to invite her to come up to the stage. Okay, thanks for having me, at least. It's awesome to be here. Um, and great to see some people face to face as well, so fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm here to talk about Daisy Hill Koala Centre and first of all I'd like to ask um, to put your hand up if you have not been to Daisy Hill Koala Centre yet. Fantastic. Are you guys local? You're local? Ah, okay. So this is, uh, this is interesting because it is a little bit of a, um, a secret spot, a, a hidden gem. A lot of people don't know about it even though it's been there for a long, long time. Um, and our, taking this opportunity to actually introduce you to the Daisy Hill Koala Centre, talk to you a little bit about what we can offer there and what we've been doing um, over the last um, two decades nearly and, and um, talk a little bit about what, what you can see there when you go and, and visit. So it is really essentially a place to learn about koalas and their conservation mainly because it is the Koala Centre. Um, I'm currently the Senior Wildlife Officer sitting in the space there at the Daisy Hill Koala Centre. And I'd like to introduce you to at least some of the photos to, um, to maybe uh, prompt you to visit there soon. But before I go into that, because uh, it is located in Daisy Hill, Daisy Hill Koala Centre, I'm just wondering whether you know what this is. Any ideas? I know, I ask questions. I know you know, Jim. <laughs> so when you think about Daisy Hill, this is actually the plant or the flower that Daisy Hill was named after. So when we're thinking around Daisy Hill, it's actually the daisy-like flower that was um, found when the Dennis family um, settled, the first European settlers for this area here, um, and they named Daisy Hill after this, this particular flower because they were plentiful in the area. And so this is actually the Oliria nestri, which is actually not a daisy, it's a daisy-like uh, plant, but that's where Daisy Hill got its name from, and I thought to introduce that to you um, as well. They are not flowering at the moment, it's quite hard to see them flower, because they're, they're only a short time where they actually in flower, around August, um, Jim shared with me before. So if you do want to see them in flower, you've got to try and, and go and look out in August to, to find them. So Daisy Hill. So it's all about the location and it's really only 15 minutes from here, a really short drive just over the M1 to the other side um, and it's located within the Daisy Hill Conservation Park here in Logan. It was actually a timber reserve in uh, sort of around 1874 and declared only state forest in 1917. Um, 1986 State Forest Park but in 2006, so many years later, it was gazetted as the Daisy Hill Conservation Park to be used for habitat and recreation. And if you are a keen mountain biker or you've got a dog or you like hiking, there's lots and lots of trails that you can walk around there and enjoy um, this particular forest. There are koalas there as well. Um, Look, a lot of people ask us, like, how many koalas are in this particular area? And there are, the chance that you see one is um, very apparent. Um, you just have to really uh, spend some time on the right trails and, and, and seeking them out. But they are, um, there have been koala counts in the past between 30 and 130, where they're saying four years ago when there was the most recent um, count. But it is part of the 1,500 hectares of koala bushland. Um, coordinated conservation area as well and it is one of the most intact natural koala habitats between Brisbane and the Gold Coast. So if you haven't been there, you, you've been missing out. So it was actually built, the centre itself was built by the Queensland Government as a dedicated koala education facility. Um, it's something to learn around the koala and was opened to the public in 1995. It is free entry and it's a wonderful way to learn around sort of the koalas that we have in the area, their plight, um, as well as a koala ambulance service that we have at, had at the time. It had a number of um, captive koala displays and it really made koala conservation um, accessible to the community. We've got a, a picture there of, the of James Dennis's land, uh, of James Dennis that was um, 
the sort of the, his land was integrated within that conservation park as well. And we're lucky to have um, Jim Dennis here with the blue shirt in the middle, who's actually the great, great, great grandson of those early settlers of, um, of Daisy Hill. So if you wanted to have a chat to him about that history, he is here and happy to, he's always happy for a chat, aren't you, uh, Jim? So happy to, for you to, to chat to him later on. Um, but really when you're thinking around sort of that um, first experience with koalas, has everyone seen a koala in the wild before? Hands up if you have not seen a koala in the wild. Okay, you're all koala lovers, that's why you're here, so that's a very expected. But for many people, you know, they have never seen a koala in the wild and their first experience to see a koala is often within a zoological setting. Um, and to be able to provide that to the community, to have that connection with the koalas and, and why we need to protect them, it's, um, it's often important to have those ambassadors there and, and feel that connection as well. And that's also part of the mantra of those gateway visitor centres that we have. No one will protect what they don't first care about and no one will care about what they don't first experience. So it's really providing those experiences for the general public so they start caring and protecting um, what they start learning around as well. So it's really important to have these visitor centres available um, and those koala ambassadors that we have there um, that can tell that story about sort of what's happened to them and, and why and sort of get people on board to, to help protect them. So in the early days, the koala ambulance operated throughout Logan and surrounds. Now we've got the lovely RSBCA and Wildcare um, that are here today as well um, that are assisting in, in, in that area. So we no longer have the uh, koala ambulance operating. Um, we had the rangers attending external events with koala, so that involved a lot of school groups and a lot of visits to, um, to community. Um, but also in the early days, we did a lot of plantation work. So we has actually established um, a plantation at the Daisy Hill State School that is supporting um, the koalas at the koala center for food. And it's been really a, a very difficult year for the koalas in terms of food because it's been very, very dry and it's been really hard to find uh, proper leaf for them. So we've been really had to be re reliable on this particular plantation many times to find some um, proper food for them. So we're very grateful for the Daisy Hill State School to be able to um, provide that for us. Um, we've been cutting there this week already quite a lot of leaf um, because the other leaf cutters have to, you know, span enormous distances to, to find uh, really good quality leaf. Um, koalas can be quite fussy as well. They don't all eat, um, you know, the particular leaf that you offer. Um, and if you want to speak to Yolanda, um, who's here today as well, she can tell you a little bit more about what leaves, um, leaf the, uh, the koalas that we, we care for prefer. There's some beautiful leaf on the table um, out there that you can smell. It's got a really beautiful citrus smell, so if you haven't smelled it yet, come and, come and see us. And unfortunately, people online can't, but that's the benefit of being right here. So we've, there's been some changes since 1995. Um, there's been some amazing major uh, upgrades to the centre in, um, since, since sort of the 2018 Commonwealth Games. It's been an upgrade to the exhibition area and the displays as well. We've had department name and uniform changes and you see now we've, we're now the Department of Science um, and um, Environment and Science and Innovation. So we've had the innovation added to it as well. Um, we've had uniform changes, so you might recognise the, um, the possum. You might see it uh, just on that badge over there. But does anyone know what kind of possum that is? Not you, Yolanda? Anyone? No? Well, it is, is, it is a ring-tailed possum, but the specific species I'm after. So, yeah, you're in the right direction, just not quite. It's like eight points out of ten. Any? Okay, so it's the Herbert River ringtail possum. And it only lives in sort of um, northeast Queensland, so around Cairns, around sort of a 600 metre height um, level. So it's, it's not endangered, but um, they are, you know, be due to climate change, sort of pushed out in that region, going further, having to go further, further up. And then sort of they're sitting on top of the mountain, not being able to go anywhere. So it's actually a really good symbol at the moment for sort of the, the changes that we're going through in the environment. Um, and, you know, the, the label, the, the badge is really recognisable. So in terms of um, yeah, being, being rangers and, and part of that. So we also had changes to the name. So there's wildlife officers and rangers. So the wildlife officer really um, engaged with sort of that wildlife and, and wildlife management, while the rangers is more um, to do with park management and tracks and, and, and maintenance, etc. 
The Koala Ambulance no longer operates from Daisy Hill as well, so that's, um, that's been stopped a little while ago because we've had some wonderful um, teams as part of RSBCA and Wildcare that are taking on um, that um, in the area as well. But as I said, the centre has been there for a little while. Um, and so we've had already a million visitors walking through the door since 1995. That's 10,000 days of, of visitation that we've had. Um, open seven days a week other than three days a year, Christmas, um, Good Friday. Um, and yeah, open from uh, 10 to 4. So it's uh, the, the, free vis the free entry um, makes it also accessible, especially within the, Lo in the Logan region, to have that you know, all sorts of walks of life um, can visit, and especially for international visitors that often travel through from Brisbane to the Gold Coast and can then have a stop um, and visit uh, Daisy Hill Koala Centre. So these are some of the displays that you might see in there, and some of our koala ambassadors. Obviously, we have uh, one male and um, four females there, um, so five koalas in total, and he's quite happy to be the only boy there um, at the moment and they all have a story to tell. So they can't be released back into the wild and you'll find out more when you visit why that, that is the case. We've also developed some um, teacher education packs. So these are free resources to the community and to schools to come and visit um, self-guided curriculum match materials, free available so if you wanted to have a look at them or put your name down to, um, to receive those free of charge. I'm happy to share that with you. They all match with all the, the messaging as well from the Southeast Queensland Koala Conservation Strategy. So these are some of the current and future focuses coming up. We have obviously um, the Griffith University partnership where we are um, talking around sort of leave it program and, and um, sharing uh, those messages as well. And also the messages with our partners like QTFN, where we uh, speak about sort of how we work together in order to achieve those um, the strategy goals. It's part of the Gateway Visitor Centre, so the Fantastic Four, I call them, Daisy Hill Koala Centre, um, the Walkabout Creek Discovery Centre at Mount Nebo, David Flay is part of that, and Mon Repo Turtle Centre is also part of those four. Um, and they're all managed by um, the Department of Environment, Science and Innovation, and of put those two here because they're all close to this area if you um, would like to visit one day. And that's it. The mission is free. Come and visit. More information on a QR code. And yeah, thank you. Thanks again, Maggie, for stepping in and speaking and working. Now tonight the questions will be fielded through the Slido technology so please do if you have a question for the speakers scan that code and please send your questions through at any time. Maybe you could ask someone next to you to put the question in or one of our team. That would be fine. So Again, just a reminder that the RSPCA, like you can actually scan this as well, and actually it becomes a contact inside your telephone. So at any point in time, you are very welcome to also scan that one and just keep it. Because as I said before, not all of us can remember everything, everywhere, all of the time. Now our final speaker tonight is Chantelle, who will actually talk to you about the amazing work that they actually do um, to support koalas and, and rescue them and more importantly, the lucky moments where we actually get to return them. So Chantelle, can I invite you to come up, please? All right. Um, so I apologise, I haven't written anything down. Um, I can talk underwater about what I do, so I usually just talk off the cuff. Um, I've got plenty of photos to share too, though. Um, so... We are the RSPCA rescue unit, um, so we want to run a unit all the way across Queensland. Um, so a little bit about me first. Um, so my new job title is actually rescue operations supervisor. Um, so I have been in the rescue world for a long time um, and I've been a part of the rescue unit um, for quite a while. I started with the RSPCA back in 2015. Um, so it's close to eight years that I've been around um, and I've been in all parts of the shelter. Um, but once I found myself in the rescue unit, I found my family and I know that's where I'll stay for probably the rest of my life now. Um, I've also dabbled in a little bit of um, work with the council um, over the years and um, a little fun fact is I've fostered 34 animals over the years and only failed once. 
which is for anyone who doesn't know what a fail is, that's when you keep them and you don't bring them back. <laughs> um, another fun fact about myself is I am very commonly known to rock into the office um, absolutely saturated um, and very well known to go swimming for animals in distress. So. Um, so the RSPCA rescue unit runs um, all the way across Queensland. We are one of only three staff rescue units um, and one of only one, five staff rescue units in Australia. So for a staff rescue unit, there is only us, there is Australia Zoo and there's one running down in wires um, on the Gold Coast. Um, and that's the only ones that actually have the ability to pay staff. Um, the reason we pay staff is because we have the ability to get licensing that you can't get as a volunteer. So um, some organisations have um, special exemptions and are allowed to get some of the licensing. Um, but for us, it means that we can have things like a medicine accreditation to sedate injured animals. Um, we can have firearms licences um, to do remote sedation. Um, and we can also um, carry our powers as an inspector to enter somebody's property should there be a wild animal in distress on the property. Um, so we rescue sick, injured or trapped wildlife um, and domestic animals that don't have an owner aware of the situation. Um, so that really can be anything. So that can be anything from a sheep to a koala to a possum to a frog. Um, we will rescue pretty much anything. Um, we run the 1300 animal number. Um, so that's not necessarily widely known that that's actually RSPCA's phone lines that that goes to. Um, so on all those signs you see that's um, our call centre that pick up the lines for that. Um, our unit provides coordination and advice for the whole of Queensland. So we receive calls from anywhere in Queensland. If there isn't a wildlife rescue group or a volunteer group that's able to assist, that will come through to our phone lines for our rescue team. So that can sometimes mean dealing with a job in the middle of the night up in Cairns, um, which can be quite devastating for our team sometimes when there's not many resources because you are stuck with a job that you can't attend yourself and all you want to do is drive and pick it up. Um, so, from our um, rescue unit that runs out of Wakehall, um, we have two staff units that run out of there during the day and at night, um, and then we have lots of volunteers just depending on coverage as to who we've got and where they are. Um, we cover the area by car all the way from Wakehall up to Bribie Island. Um, so that's Bribie Island, Caboolture, um, Burpengary all the way up. Um, and then we come all the way down to the New South Wales border and in as far as Gatton. We have been known to do the occasional trip out further than Gatton, but we try and restrict ourselves to Gatton. Otherwise, we're, we've got two vans, um, usually one on the south side of Brisbane, one on the north side, north side of Brisbane. So sending someone out really, really far means that they're not able to respond to the critical incidents that happen in the city. Um, so I did pull some stats. I'm not 100% sure how correct they are, but this is what it came up with for me. Um, that in 2023, we received calls for 184 requests um, for assistance with koalas. Um, so that could be anything from sick, injured or misplaced koalas. Um, and to think about that, um, koala season is usually about seven months long, give or take. Um, it's getting longer every year. Um, so that still is quite a lot of animals um, over only a seven month period. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about rescuing a koala because it's a bit of a unique experience. It's not like any other animal. Any other animal goes up a tree and there's not much you can do. Um, a bird flies away from you, there's not much you can do. A possum goes up a tree, you really can't do much. But a koala is 90% of the time in a tree. Um, so my biggest challenge, um, and I'm very well known to not be able to find the koala to start with. Um, so there is a koala in the tree, um, but if I didn't know where it was, I probably wouldn't be able to tell you where it is. Um, <laughs> I don't know if any of anyone can spot it. Anyone want to <laughs> have a go? Once you know where it is, it comes very obvious. <laughs> um, so he is right up in the fork. Um, so in that image, he's on the what would be your right-hand side. Um, up in that fork up the top. So um, this koala is, um, was one of our tricky ones. So being at that height, that's quite difficult for us. Um, we do carry poles and things in the car that can reach that height, but with the amount of branches for them to jump to, that makes it quite difficult. Um, koalas are not like any other animal. 
Um, they're not as smart as you think they are, um, and they have a lot of quirks. So we have found that um, the best way to rescue them is actually to um, scare them and use that to your advantage. So um, if you are outside at the tables, you'll see some of our rescue equipment that we've brought with us. Um, so we've got something called a flag, which is a big scary stick um, with a big, um, usually something scary on the end. So we use emergency blankets or um, fluoro vests or anything that makes a loud noise and is loud and scary. Um, pop that up over their head and they often don't like it, so they'll start to come down. Problem with this tree and flagging is the fact that there are branches everywhere, so um, trying to get one or two people with poles up um, is just going to cause the koala to jump around the tree. So um, this is a situation where we would either call in a tree climber or set a trap. Um, and we did set a trap for this koala, but um, much to our dismay, he did not go into our trap um, and we've lost sight of him now. Um, but this property, we attended for one koala and we came away with two and one that we couldn't catch. So very often that's what happens. You'll find that there's more than one there. Um, we were very fortunate to get that many from this property when we only went in for one. Um, sometimes they do make it easy. Um, so this is one of my rescues. This is Susie and Baby Q. Um, Susie and Baby Q, um, Baby Q has slight conjunctivitis, which is why we were concerned about them. Um, we had gotten to the point where they were too high in a tree and decided we might just have to leave them be um, and hope that they come down close to the ground next time we come. Um, we had a rescuer on site actually monitoring the tree just while they were on the phone. Uh, they weren't actually staying or anything like that and they said, oh, yep, I think we'll leave them there. I said, okay, no problem. Maybe 10 minutes later I get a call. Oh, things have changed. I've got them in a bag together. And I said, oh, okay, how did you get them down? Oh, well, baby Q fell and mum came down to get him, so I wandered over and picked them up. Um, so we're very fortunate that sometimes they make it easy on us. Sometimes they rescue themselves and bring themselves down. Um, sometimes the flagging method works like a charm. Sometimes you can get it done really quickly. But as most koala rescuers know, the majority don't go like that. Um, they jump, they cause trouble, they're not the most friendly animal to deal with, so um, majority of them are not um, the easiest to rescue. Um, so this is little Boris. Um, Boris is in care with a wildlife carer at the moment. Um, one of our rescue officers sent this one through to me to include today. Um, so his mum was hit by a car on the Brisbane Valley Highway um, and Boris made a run for it, um, but we're very, very fortunate that he didn't make it away and he was able to be rescued and in care now. Um, so just a little bit more about rescue equipment because it is a little bit different. Um, there is no other animal that you could ever get down in the same way that you do a koala. Um, so we use flags, which are a DIY um, that most koala rescuers just make themselves. Um, so they're made from anything scary um, that you can think of that makes a loud noise. Uh, one of the new ones is putting bells on the end to try and make them louder and scarier. Um, we use things called halos, which can be anything from a circle with a pillowcase on it to a plastic bucket lid. Um, you'll see some of that out on our table as well. Um, so those are for when the koalas are down a bit lower, you're able to get above their head and push them down using it. Um, the koalas really don't like anything over their head, so once they're low enough, you can actually use your hands as well to try and push their heads down, um, which try and do that with a possum and you ain't going to get far. Um, we are in the process of building traps. Um, we currently borrow them from wildlife carers when we need them, um, but we are in the process of building our own. Um, koala cages, anyone would think you could just put them in any cage, um, but it's actually a specific, specific cage built for koalas um, due to their size and um, the nature of the requirement that they need. Um, most of our cages actually carry a pool noodle in them, and most people don't know what on earth, why would you need a pool noodle for a koala? We actually use it to replicate a tree. Um, we wrap a towel around it and it gives the koala something to hold on to while in the cage because they're not used to sitting on the ground so it gives them something to hold on to. Um, and then a common misconception is you can put a, tr a ladder up and try and get a koala. Um, we don't use ladders bit pretty much ever. Um, reason being, would you like to bring an angry koala down a ladder? Probably not. Um, so it's a very rare case that we would use one of those. We, we use poles to bring them to us safely instead. Um, so what does the future look like for the RSPCA rescue unit? Um, so we're pretty excited for this koala season coming up. Um, we're trying to prepare um, some new equipment. So we're building, um, trying to build some new koala traps. Um, we've recently got some new rescue poles, some new rescue um, cages and things like that. Um, we're in stages of providing training to our volunteers and our staff. That's a part of my new role um, is to provide training to our 
teams and get them up to speed on koalas before the next season. Um, and we have some strategies in place for next season, what that's going to look like for us. And um, for me, that's really exciting. Um, the more that we can do for koalas, the more that we can get, the more that we can get them into care, the quicker um, is really exciting. So. Um, and lastly, we need the support from anyone who wants to help. Um, we take volunteers with us in the cars as assistants and driving on the road. So if you're ever interested um, in that kind of work, you can come out and actually get your hands dirty and do it. Um, and we also run a wildlife responders program, which is where you can sign up and operate out of your own vehicle in your own suburb. So you select what area you're available for, they'll send you a text message to say there's a rescue in your area and you can respond, um, which has just come back and refreshed. So um, we're really excited to see more people sign up for that. Um, and obviously we always need donations. Um, RSPCA is majority donation funded. So all of our vehicles, all of our equipment is pretty much from donations. So um, if anyone is keen, <laughs> we're more than happy to um, take that on board. Um, and if anyone has a keen eye in how to build a koala trap, we would also love to hear from you. All right. It's been wonderful to hear from our four speakers tonight. And Kate was going to share a little bit about the, the learning she had from her science work where she'd been digging deep into all sorts of areas um, to understand the koala data that's actually available. And she was very deeply immersed in all of that and would have had quite a bit to, to say. So if I can ask our um, speakers to come up to stage. And what we're actually going to do, I've got questions here. Um, to just address the challenge of not having phones, we've got ability to have the questions on paper, so my team will grab those and bring them up. But um, what we're actually doing tonight is actually asking the speakers to just come up here, if you may. And what we're going to do is with our microphone, just I'll direct the questions. Um, and sometimes I'm knowing who I'm directing it to, and at other times I may need help because um, there's definitely one that's come in that may not be where I need it to go. So, again, just shoot the questions in because we're happy to uh, take a few now as we actually go through. Um, Sam, this is a question that was directed to you, so I will start with you if that's okay, and there's a few that follow. So I will start a little bit in sequence and then it'll probably start to mix up as a few other questions come in. I know myself, I had millions, but this isn't about me. Have any parts of the Karatha forest been assessed for suitability for relocation of koalas? Hello. Okay. Um, Karawatha Forest is within the Brisbane City Council jurisdiction, so I'm not 100% across what's been going on in that area. But definitely in terms of assessing where koalas do go, that's especially where we rely on the state government mapping and the, um, in terms of core koala habitat and the other information that's being collected about um, koala health and disease as well to help inform where koalas are released or where um, restoration and on-ground actions occur. Beautiful. Maggie, I might get you to step in a little bit afterwards and we can circle back with a bit of extra stuff around that one. Um, Conservancy has had tremendous success using the enclosure model. Has this been done in Logan for excluding predators from koala habitat? In terms of like the development and the, or like excluding developers from koala habitat, a lot of what, when it comes to those sides of things, it's definitely where we rely on our planning scheme, mapping and methodology, and especially our biodiversity corridors um, and using that to help inform that decision making and really honing in on those areas as the important connectivity points. Um, sort of answer that question? Well, if it doesn't, we they'll, can also they'll throw yeah. another one in. <laughs> It'll be very good. So yes, anyone online, you're very welcome to send these through and they'll keep coming through. Um, now this one, you start with you, Sam, but then we might also ask a few of the others because they may have different variations for the answer. With the many different ways to record a sighting, like Des has got the Q Wildlife app, Logan's got an app, there's iNaturalist. What is the best way to record a sighting? Whatever is easiest for you. 
um, a lot of organisations such as Logan and other platforms, we, we, we actually share that data with um, through other platforms. So whatever you're most likely and it's easiest for you to report your sighting, continue to do it that way um, because it's just important to report it rather than being worried about who exactly to report it to. But, yeah, I would say a lot of us are just open to sharing that information as well. So we will gather and pull from other avenues that you may have reported it to. Yeah, and if I can add to that as well, um, if you are reporting, just make sure you report it once. So if you cite a koala, not to report it to and a naturalist and to all the different apps because it's all doubling up and that's how you can create potentially a backlog in sort of the data analysis um, at a later stage. So whatever you use, just use it once and record it there. Um, obviously, as part of Queensland uh, uh, government, we've developed the Q Wildlife app, which has been really improved over the time since it's launched in, um, at the end of 2022. Um, and that will be all downloadable data as well. That data is going to WildNet. Um, and that will be sort of all uh, used for the mapping and threat management as part of the state government. So, um, but if councils have their own apps as well, you know, feel free to use that because that's used by council for their um, own mapping at the same time. So it just depends on wh where you would have a think around what you would like the data to be used for. And if you'd like that to go directly to, let's say, council to take some action immediately around a particular threat or a sick koala, then that may be, you know, a better platform. But if you'd like that to be used for um, state government mapping and biodiversity assessment purposes, then Q Wildlife is a, is a good tool for that. Thank you. Now, this one is a question for you, Marie. How did you find or target the landowners for the Scattered Tree Project? That is a very good question. Um, and yeah, I guess um, because we haven't got it rolled out just yet, um, I think we'll just use our existing networks, catchment groups, uh, just planning to just get that information out there. Um, also looking at potentially uh, some uh, sort of livestock networks um, to see if any landholders that are uh, involved in primary pro productivity uh, might be interested in doing some sort of, um, yeah, revegetation across their properties. Uh, again, there's a lot of evidence out there to support um, sort of scattered trees as being uh, really advantageous for livestock um, as well as for wildlife. Um, so we're hoping to be able to benefit, um, yeah, uh, both the landholders, livestock, as well as wildlife. And there's a further continuation, but I just want to just bombard you all at once. Do they sign an agreement for the one tree or for an area? Oh, um, sorry, uh, what does that? So it's just literally a continuation. It says, do they sign an agreement for the one tree? So as they're... Oh, no. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, no, look, uh, that will sort of be a side project, sort of similar to our uh, community plantings. They're only sort of smaller scale, um, so we would not request um, a uh, protective mechanism over those plantings. Um, it's really just for our main uh, KHRPP projects where there's significant investment in um, that we require that protective mechanism. Thank you very much. Sometimes I'm just working with what I've got here, so just bear with me. <laughs> no, it was a good question. It's a, a fun one as I go, mm, not, <laughs> not quite sure what they meant. Chantelle, this might be a question for you, but feel free to direct it to others. How are calls to the 1300 animal routed or handled? Um, so our, we have a call centre that answers the 1300 animal numbers. Um, so they then um, will lodge a job based on that. Um, our call centre dispatchers um, will try and find um, local wildlife areas and things like that before sending them through, um, and then they get dispatched directly to our unit. I think that answers the second question, which was, are they referred elsewhere? So it yeah, sounds we like work the with all of yes. the major wildlife groups and all of the individual wildlife rescuers, so um, we lean on them a lot um, before it comes to us having to go out ourselves, because if we did the number of jobs that our call centre receives, we, yeah, Perfect. wouldn't have the ability to do it. Okay, so there's one here that says, it's not really a question, and uh, they're not sure which speaker's going to respond if they would like to respond, but I've read horror stories about translocation of koalas from development sites in southeast Queensland, where out of the 400 translocated one year later, nearly all of them had actually died. So if anyone is able or wants to comment. 
I, like we haven't done any work in Logan about translocation, but I do know that other um, agencies have been looking into that. And I know that there has been some other processes and procedures that have been in place to help improve that situation for other smaller scale um, works that have been done. But translocation is definitely a last resort. The first, like we need to look at other mechanisms um, to help protect but um, and preserve the koala habitat that is there. So I don't know if you've got... Yep, that's great. Thanks, Sam. Sorry, glasses on, off. Marie, this one's a question for you. Are you concerned about koala cattle interactions when you're doing revegetation on cattle stations? Um, there is research out there to suggest that um, there has been uh, cattle uh, attacks on koalas. Um, so I haven't found a lot of information on it, uh, only a couple of papers. Um, but I guess the plan, plan would be to make sure that the trees are close enough um, so that koalas can move between um, uh, those trees safely. Um, yeah, that's kind of what the plan would be. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, uh, already, you know, they're having to cross really wide spanses of land um, to get between those koala habitat areas. So if we can, you know, reduce that distance between trees, um, I think that's a much better outcome. Less time on ground, yeah. more time up, which gives them the chance to actually get away. Um, again, this one isn't specified to any one person. Um, so. See, see how you, who feels like answering. Koala feed and shelter trees take so long to grow. Will we have enough time to save our koalas? Um, yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, they do take a lot of time and a lot of investment. Um, and I think that, yeah, we all should be doing as much as we can to um, uh, sort of stop uh, tree clearing. Um, as a first priority, um, habitat restoration is fantastic um, with previously cleared areas. Um, but yeah, we, we need to be doing more to stop the actual clearing. And I would say that no local government or state government wants to be the first to put their hand up and say koalas have gone extinct in our area. So there's definitely that motivation and drive to do what we can to um, ensure koalas continue to move throughout our areas. And it's everyone's responsibility as well. It's not just, you know, the groups that we have here or, or government or council, but it's everyone making a difference in your own backyard, um, even planting native plants and just doing your little bits here and there, creating little corridors, learning about and sharing the message, slowing down on roads, um, reporting sightings, you know, all those things are all going towards protecting um, the, and stabilising the, the populations that we have. Keeping your dog on a leash training your dog to come back. <laughs> you can even train them to avoid koalas. Did you know that? You didn't know about the Leave It app. It's something that's actually available that um, we can actually use at any time. And I'm just cruising through my slide decks there. At the moment, there are no more questions that have come in. Um, so I would invite any of you to stay and have a, a conversation with us or a question afterwards. Um, first, I would just really like to thank my team. I'm not even sure they're all present sitting in the room. Actually, I just about cite most of them. Um, firstly, Brooklyn Downs, who was behind the initial setup. She's due to have a bub very, very shortly and isn't with us tonight. Tori Seedor down the front, Kim Savannah at the back, and Megan and also Louise, who have been assisting um, to make it all happen tonight. So on behalf of me, thanks, team. Um, I know it takes a lot of work and also to our our beautiful tech support here from Griffith University as well. Thanks, Anthony, for all of the hard work you do. So from all of us, and most importantly, I think, here tonight, our speakers, who these are busy people who are doing their level best to do what they actually can, and I'd really like to thank them for their time this evening and for coming along and actually joining us, because um, already it's sort of out of hours as we actually do it, and we must have a So a couple of questions we actually have here, um, and one of them I think you actually did 
um, answer, Maggie, were how many koalas are there at Daisy Hill and the reserves, which I think the answer was you're still not exactly sure. There was, there was a count of about four years ago and there was a me the measure was between 30 and 130, but because it's a large area and they're not consistent surveys are happening, it's a hard to put a number to that. Yeah. Um, could you actually tell me how many rangers are stationed at Daisy Hill? Yeah, we're on, we've got five, uh, well, we've got wildlife officers. So there's five wildlife officers at the Daisy Hill Visitor Centre and then there's rangers at the top. Um, there's at the moment around four or five that are uh, dedicated to Daisy Hill Conservation Park, um, but they're often being called out to other areas as well where, where needed with the fires, for example, you know, in, in, on the Sunshine Coast or wherever they, they get called out and, and assist elsewhere. And can you tell me about any other climate change initiatives that are happening for Daisy Hill, like water tanks or dieback? And this might not be the right person. It's not her day to day. Well, we've seen with the drought and obviously the change in climate where and it's been really hard to find leaf for the koala, so the growth um, has been really slow. And, and so we've had to really... The leaf cutters have been really working hard to cover a lot more area in order to find leaf for the koalas. Um, so the growth has been really quite slow. And then obviously with a, you know intense rain, that growth is also impacted. So you see with heavy rainfall, you do storms where you know a lot of the plantations have been affected by that as well. And that's all part of, of the climate change sort of impacts or changing climate, changing change in temperature um, as well within the forest. And you'll see that a lot of animals are moving, so you increase the find, trying to find food, you have a lot more koalas that are moving to try and find uh, food somewhere and, and then putting themselves in situations where they are at risk, whether it's in someone's backyard or you know, encountering um, pets or domestic animals that aren't so friendly um, to, towards koalas or in a swimming pool um, or crossing roads. So you have you know, a, a trickle-on effect from you know, the those impacts from climate and change, and, and change in temperature where they are, you know, pressed to find, you know, food as well, yeah. Yeah, I think Marie spoke to that pretty well too, just how hard it is to get things going, to then get them smashed over by a flood, the joys of the southeast Queensland corner. It's a pretty tough area. Um, look, Ted, there are a couple of other questions here that I'll endeavour to also get answers back to you, and, and thanks for giving me your email. Um, for everyone else, in the interest of um, allowing you to get up and stretch, Thank you very much for coming tonight and for being here. If any of you want any further information about the where or the what you might want to do in terms of volunteering, please do come and approach us. If we don't know, we'll go straight to other people who we think know and we keep asking until we can start to cut through. And I can tell you on behalf of my team that when people reach out, we really are trying to listen and there is so much need in this space and that's the heart that most of our team bring to this work every day. I wish already that we could do more. And as the team have said here of speakers, it is a shared responsibility. So the more we can just get others to really want to do more, knowing it takes so long for the trees to grow, the better off we're all going to be. So for all of you again, thank you so much for coming and please do come up and have a chat if you'd like to actually talk more. Thank you.